Okay. Well, I'm going to start because they limited my four hour workshop to a 30 minute talk. Um, my name is Mariah Peterson. Everything I'm going to show you today can be found at this GitHub repo with instructions for how to run it. Um, I don't suggest you follow along because there's a little bit of environment setup you'd have to do, and that would take longer than the 30 minutes we have to talk about it. Um, but hopefully I've made it explanatory enough that you can go clone the repo and run it at home on your own after work. Um, hopefully. Um, oh, and I just want to say, if you want to contact me, you can follow me on GitHub or Twitter. At Captain Nobody One is my Twitter handle. I'm relatively active. I tweet a lot about stuff that we meet up and stuff here in Utah. So if you care, that's I don't have slides, so I had to put it in there somewhere. Um, so welcome to this lovely demo. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, on the online description, it was I changed what we're talking about since then. So basically, what I plan to do today is show you the power of the Go programming language to implement a very simple machine learning model. It's called uh, K nearest neighbor model. Um, we should go into a little bit more detail of what that is today. Um, but I just want to start out with the beginning and run through how we would get the data, build and deploy this model. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me at any time uh, and I can answer them. Not a big deal at all. Just if, before you begin, can you make your screen? Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to be on the screen for half a second, but yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, this is my repo I've cloned. Uh, machine learning models and development of models is often done in one of two ways, either in a script or in a Jupyter notebook. I'm doing it in a Jupyter notebook. So let's start with the T, um, which is great. It starts the server and opens it up, make that bigger. And I have some stuff in here that I could have just pressed that button, but my environment was already set up. So. Um, this is Jupyter's nice little UI. Uh, we can start a whole bunch of new things. We can do a terminal, we can do a folder, a text file, or we could do a Python or Go notebook. Uh, we don't need to start anything new because I've already built it. It's right here. Okay, is that big enough? Can everybody see on at least one of the screens something? Um, oh look, there's a, there's a weird symbol right there. Don't we love it? Um, benefits of Jupyter notebooks is quick accessing. So, um, in machine learning, the basis of machine learning is we are teaching a computer how to understand and predict from data, right? Um, the most popular languages for machine learning in production or per, for right now are Python and R. Um, but Go is a beautiful language because A, uh, it has a lot of built-in concurrencies. The whole reason for using GPUs and TPUs as your hardware is because of the concurrency built into the hardware. But Go has it built into the actual deployment patterns of the language. So you can get the same concurrency on a CPU that you would get on the GPU hardware. So it's a little bit easier to uh, build powerful deployments um, another thing that's really important is Go has a very strong typing system in it, um, which is good for data management um, and data pipelining. So you can build all of the steps of your data pipeline or your data manipulation or your model in Go. You don't have to switch between two languages and figure out how to, if you need to use an endpoint or a Kafka screen or a web socket or whatever you want to do to actually access your model. You can build the whole thing in one beautiful language. So today, as we run through this model, um, I found a whole bunch of data on this lovely website. It's called datahub.io. It's a bunch of free uh, test, data, test data sets 
that you can use. Um, and the one I chose, my background is in physics, so I figure a nice, good astronomy data set would be good. Uh, so basically, it's a whole bunch of stars, um, and there are either hydronic stars or another type. So the whole point of this model is to classify stars or clusters of stars as hydronic. Okay, that is our purpose. Um, so first thing first, we got to get our data. Um, so we just wrote a nice little script. This is the equivalent of a smart script um, to bring it in. Um, and we're using a data frame. If you've used Python at all, you're familiar with the idea of a data frame. It basically just makes your data look like a table. Nice, easy to read, easy to understand, easy to look through, and you can run basic statistics on it to uh, just understand what your data is. So, um, we are pulling in a CSV into our data frame, and then we just print it out and go. And this is what we get. We see that there is a length, a width, a size. Um, these conk and conk L1 relate to the um, ellipticity of the orbit or of your cluster. So if it, it has to do with the short radius and the long radius of your ellipse. Um, your asymmetry affects that. Then you have a whole bunch of stuff down here that we were unfortunately unable to look at. But if we wanted to look at them, we, we could do something else, which is right here. Um, you can do a data frame dot select and pick different tables that you want to look at. In this case, I only cared about the width, the size, the class, and the ID. As you can see here, we have a whole bunch of D classes, which is not hadronic. Hadronic, we want an H class. Um, and I mentioned before, you can do basic statistics. Here we see that we have the mean, standard deviation, the min, our percentiles, and our max. So we see that the average width is 22. That is most likely some kind of light year uh, measurement for a galaxy. If it's a star, it would be probably some kind of kilometer times 10 to the something. Um, the min is zero, which means we probably don't have that data. And the max would be 25. We can get the 25th. The 75, which shows that there's a huge skew to one side, right? If 24 is your 75th percentile, but your biggest is 255, there's a huge gap in that. So these are all things that we can understand from the data frame. Did you have a question, Julie? <laughs> you saw my question eyes that they were forming. Um, <laughs> so this is our uh, so this is our data set that we already have, right? This is and what I pulled down from Data Hub. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we have our data set. Now we're just looking at it to see like so the nature of it. we're trying to do from scratch a machine learning model. Mm -hmm. The first thing first is you need to know what your data is, right? Because whatever the model says, it needs to make sense. Your model could tell you anything. And it could tell you that none of the stars are hydronic. They're actually all purple and we can't see anything. The sky, the entire sky is actually yellow at night, right? But that's not expected. We expect it to say that there's only a couple of stars, you know, as opposed to the night, and you, that there's not a whole ton of hadronic stars. We only expect a few. So we have to be able, just by looking at these things, we should be able to understand at least what the data is telling us and if it's a good data set and if the results we see are expected. Okay, so we might need to clean up our data. Exactly. So this, so seeing it like this would tell us if we need to clean the data, if the data set's even viable for this, just basic things. Okay. And then you can see from there. Um, another step in understanding your data, um, apart from, yeah, you have like a really huge outlier in your data. Do you remove it before going forward? It depends. So you saw how our 75th percentile was 24, but our max was 256. Um, now removing that outlier 256 could introduce a bias to our data because that is an expected size for a star. We can get a star that big. We don't want to remove that data, even though it's a huge outlier, because we don't want to introduce that bias. So it depends on if the data is an expected anomaly or if it is uh, just dirty data. And if it's the case, um, 
because of bias, it would want to be, we'd want to remove a chunk of data. Say we have a bunch of data that we, ex we know is corrupted, like the machine we were using cut out and was not producing correct data, that we would safely remove without introducing bias. But if the machine and everything was working right and we still got anomalies, then we wouldn't want to remove that. We would want that bias in our trained model. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so back to visualize again. Um, so there's a, in Go, the struggle with Go in um, the machine learning thing is also, their libraries don't really work together yet. If you've used Python, you know that uh, pandas works really well with NumPy, works really well with Matlibplot, works really well with your, your scikit-learn and all those stuff. They work really well together. Go's not there yet. We don't like to share packages or we don't go doesn't like to have a whole lot of dependencies that's part of the one of the go isms is don't have a whole lot of dependencies so they haven't quite started sharing these structures yet so unfortunately when we use the go num plot to visualize it we have to start over and bring our data in from scratch it's only a couple more lines of code but it is one of the in my opinion struggles of Go in this idea of machine learning and data science, something that gives Python a definite advantage. Um, so we are just gonna bring in the data in a way that we can plot it and understand it. Um, the first way we need to do it is we need to be able to store the data. We use a struct in Go. Um, it's very similar to creating an object type or a class if you're used to OOP, right? Object-oriented programming OOP. Good. Um, so the structs are very similar to that in Go. And from there, we just read in our CSV file and we assign all of these lovely things to an object in the struct and we just make a slice of those structs. So we have a huge list with a bunch of different objects in them. And when we go to, oh, and this is just telling me I'm ignoring errors, which is a big no-no in Go, but it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're doing machine learning, so we can't adhere to all of the Goisms. Um, so once we have that lovely uh, slice of images, which proof here we've done with ignoring errors, um, we're going to take that slice of images and we're going to make a bunch of points. Um, in Go, their um, plotter, their go -num plot can do a two-dimensional plot or a three-dimensional plot. As you saw, we had like 10 different criteria we could use. So I don't want a 10 dimensional plot. That would mean absolutely nothing to me. So I'm only gonna pick two criteria. Um, ideally, I would do this to a whole bunch of it, right? I would compare width to size and then width to length and then width to ellipticity and width to asymmetri asymmetricity, if it's asymmetric or not, um, and do a whole bunch of those things. But just for meanings of this example, I only did one. Um, because A, I know this data set's clean, it's been parsed and used for something else, that's why they published it. B, um, this model has been verified and it works well, so I didn't see a whole bunch of need to understand all aspects of the model to trust its accuracy numbers because of where I was coming from in this demo data set. If this was an actual data set I would be using at work, I would be much more thorough in visualizing all of the aspects of the data and understanding more the aspects, but I just wanted to demonstrate the how um, here. So we just created a simple scatter plot, um, created a nice little canvas for it right there, added labels, and then added the actual point, the actual scatter pattern to our canvas. Labels are very important because otherwise you have square with dots on it. Um, so just if you want anybody else to know what you're doing, add labels, it's three lines of code. Um, and then we just printed it out as a nice PNG file. And unfortunately, um, Go and Jupyter notebooks are not quite the best of friends. And so you have to add, in Python, you would just say display or show, and it would work. In Go, we have to add seven more, five more lines of code to get the same thing. But we are able to view this right in our Jupyter notebook and understand the patterns. We, can, we see that that 75 percentile makes sense being about right here because we have a huge cluster of data on the small side and a couple of big, just a few um, big width uh, stars and big size stars. 
And we can also see that they tend to be wider than they do generally big, which also proves to the ellipticity, right? Um, if they were truly circular, they'd go right down the middle, which none of them do, which is good because circular orbits and circular, actually circular uh, planets and stars don't really exist. We expect them to be some kind of ellipse. Um, so, any questions so far about understanding your data? No? So, this is just the first step to kind of analyze the data set you're doing to kind of yeah. see what is expected, and then the next one would be to implement the machine learning and see how it reacts. Exactly. Okay. So, if you were doing this on a data set that you knew less about, mm -hmm. right, that wasn't downloaded as a mock from some model that we didn't want to classify, we would want to know a lot about the data to understand which model to use, right? There's a whole bunch of different kinds of models from simple linear regression to huge deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the best, like, we don't know which one's going to best be able to understand and track the model and then be able to use for predictions in the future or classifications in the future. So by understanding what the data looks like and what we want to get from the data, we can narrow that down before we actually start implementing and testing. I see. So this is a really important step because if you have, like, crappy data, then you have a crappy result with the machine. Exactly. If we have, if the data is all over the place, like really bad all over the place, we could expect and see a, a machine learning model with an accuracy of 60% to be an amazing model for that data set, right? For this one, where the data was all very closely knit together, we would expect it to be a much higher model because the data is much more similar. So that helps us also to understand the accuracy in addition to what kind of model. Um, so here uh, is just the implementation of the k-nearest neighbor model. So k-nearest neighbor is a clustering style model. So basically it measures the distance between your different data points, um, data parameters, whatever they may be. We used to always have 17 and then averages them to be able to predict future things, right? So if it knows that it has a wider width, it should expect a a certain size and it should expect a certain whatever it is and it learns that based on the distances um, patterns found in between those. Um, and this is uh, implemented in the Go Learn package. Um, it has quite a few different things. It has a linear regression, it has a k-nearest neighbor, it has a logical regression, um, and it has a whole bunch of other things. I actually made a, a PR to that package while I was preparing this because it was broken. So it's fixed now because, thank you. Um, so the K nearest neighbor has a couple of unique um, things. We have the engine in the background, which we did there. The options that it provided in this package are a linear engine and a KD tree. Um, trees just is a little bit of concurrency, right? So when you do it as a tree, uh, I'm sorry, when you do a tree is an idea of a linear step, which means it does, it does, there's the, sorry, you have the linear step which compares this point to this point to this point to this point as opposed to the tree that goes here, and then it goes here, and then it goes there, and then it, you know, breaks off of that, but it does it in different orders, which just allows you a little bit of random, a randomization in your comparisons all the way down. Um, when you have a lot of data, that can be more accurate. When you don't, it can be less accurate. So it depends on your use case. For this one, we had a ton of data, so I went ahead with the KD tree, and we just did a Euclidean distance. So that's just a linear distance between the data points. There was a couple of other options, one being a vector distance, one being, there was, what was the one that was a cosine distance? There was a third one I forgot. So you can choose your distance between the data, the kind of distance you want between the data. Yes? Oh, that's what you're telling me? Well, we're almost done. <laughs> and then how you want it to <laughs> prepare. You do a quick train test split. So training data is the data you train your model on, and then your test data is the one that you test the accuracy of your model on. Um, I did a three-four split. It's common to do a two-third split, or sometimes what they do with the three-four split is they actually do a half, a fourth, and a fourth. So they have a half for training, a half for test, and then they have another one reserved because the test actually proved wrong and you have to use a different model. So they have another quarter of the data saved out that's untouched pure, so it won't influence your model at any point. But like I said, I trusted the model, so the three-four split made a whole lot of sense to me. So we just then run our prediction on it, 
And as you can see, this is it running. We had a 14,000 uh, individual data points, each with, uh, what was it, 12 rows of parameters, 12 parameters each. And it starts, this is it's what it's learning, right? It's learning the H or the G, how you want to display. And then, this is a nice little thing. When we do our tests, we want to get to know what the true positives are, what the false positives are, what the false positives and false negatives are. So basically, if it's true and we expect it to be true, or if it says true and we expect it to be false, right? If it says true, we expect it to be false, that is a true negative. And see, the false positive would be it says it's positive, but we, it's really a negative. So those numbers all come into place and we run them into different statistics called precision and recall, which I've provided true positive, true positive, false positive, true positive, true positive, false negative. That's what that means. So we run that here and we get that we had 270, no, 5,000 of our text, right? So this is only a fourth. 5,027 were true positives, yes. How do you figure out which ones are true positive and negative? Do you have to go through the data? Oh, no, it tells you. Oh, okay. When you test, when you test, so you see how I ran this evaluation on the confusion matrix? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're here, we're using labeled data, which is, so when we use labeled data, this is called supervised learning, because we know what the result is. And so we use the labels to then quantify the result. Um, this is a, a huge struggle in data science is getting the labeled data, because people usually have to go in and label them, and nobody wants to do that for millions of data. Sets. Um, some of them we can get that are pre-labeled. It depends on how you're able to work it out. There's a little bit of automation involved, um, but there's not a lot of engineers that want to also automate that process. So here with our labeled data, we're able to do that. I have what, like one minute, two minutes? Yeah, yeah. We'll Thank you. I, will, I just want to, I want to show our results. So here we have our precision and here we have our recall. As we can see, we're about 99% in each of them, which is amazing, but we had really clean data. And we had a, you know, we had a clean data, we had a proven um, model. So this is something we would expect it to be that high if we had nasty data and we were seeing 60 and 80 for, you know, if our recall was 60 and our precision was 80, we would we would want to know, sometimes we care about true positives, sometimes we care about false positives. It depends on how you're deploying the model. So that could be a good fit for you or not. If you have any other questions right now, I think I have time for one. If not, you can ask me about it more. My mind is open for information to give you. <laughs> it could be wrong, but I will still give it. <laughs> any other questions? So if the result was Yes, if you get that, I would be skeptical and I would start over because <laughs> I mean, if you do it multiple times and it's always 100% positive, then you have literally like are the best data and data scientist ever on the planet. Um, we expect there to be some error, um, but yeah, 1.0 would be 100%. If you get something higher than one, you need to look somewhere else because that's impossible. <laughs> what was the objective of this? Um, what was the objective of this? To detect hadronic stars, hadronic star clusters. Um, so we were able to, the H, the H label is what specifies it as hadronic. Um, I forgot what G was. I didn't read that closely in the description of the data. I was never an astronomer but I was a physicist, so I know what hadronic means and that was all I cared about. Um, so we are able to, from the data provided to us, from, the, I think it was from the Hubble telescope, we're able to classify something as hadronic or not relatively accurately. What best place to go for data sets for doing this kind of like? Kaggle or datahub.io. Okay. Your question? Uh, how low is different from Python or R? Is there something which makes it unique? On the other two, and why besides the concurrency that's built in to the actual when the deployment, um, you also are able to deploy it as a binary, um, which 
is nice to not have a runtime associated with it. Um, and, and the other thing is Go has a really nice uh, structure for passing data in as far as API structures that supports CRPC, HTTP, WebSockets, all of those things. So accessing the API is really nice. Um, Python has all of those things. I am not as familiar with R, yeah. um, but I know Python tends to be preferred because of its use in web development and API access. Um, but just Go's concurrency and the fact that it can be the same language that the rest of your tech stack is in, it makes it a lot easier to communicate and you don't have to do as much translation between what your data was and what you need it to be for your machine learning. It helps with the data cleanup. Okay. Welcome. Any other questions? I mean, I, you know, you can miss the rest of the things if you have more, but <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have prepared. So feel free to check this out and download it. What was that? I said you did really well. Thank you. <laughs> feel free to check out the repo. Like I said, it's uh, my user is Sawyer Pete on uh, GitHub. I have a bunch of machine learning examples. One of them doesn't work, but most of them do. Um, so you can check out other things. They're all in Go. So. Thank you so much.